Hello everyone, this is my fourth video summarizing Andrzej Sapkowski's Witcher books, and this time I will be covering Times of Contempt. Before I get started, I want to say one thing. In this book, Sapkowski introduces several new characters for just one or two pages in order to explain the political situation in all the different kingdoms. I am not going to go into a lot of detail on these scenes or their characters because I doubt they will show up again in future books. If some of them do show up later, then I will recap what it is that I skipped regarding that character. And with that, I think I'm ready to go. Times of Contempt picks up about a week after the events in Blood of Elves. To summarize where we left off, Geralt was almost able to capture Ryans, but Philippa Eilhart instead allowed Ryans to escape and prevent Geralt from learning who hired him. The Four Kingdoms had made plans to provoke a war with Nilfgaard and then recapture Sintra. Both the Nilfgaardians and the wizards know about these plans, and Ciri and Yennefer have left Miletel's temple, but we do not know where they are going. At the start of Times of Contempt, Geralt is at Dorian and going to visit an information broker named Codringer. Codringer is supposed to have an associate named Finn, but Geralt does not believe that Finn exists as nobody has ever seen him. Geralt has paid Codringer 250 crowns to gather information on Ryan's, and Codringer is now tearing, telling Geralt what he has discovered. In Blood of Elves, it was mentioned that Ryans had been killing people in his search for Ciri, and now we learn who some of these people are. The merchant family which had adopted Ciri and gave her to Geralt in Sword of Destiny has been killed. The Dryad, which gave Ciri to that merchant family, was also tortured and killed before that. This is all information that Geralt somehow already knew, but Codringer also tells Geralt that Ryans used to go to the Bannard School of Wizardry, but he was kicked out after two years for stealing. There wasn't much else interesting that happened with Ryans until he wound up in prison in Sintra for unpaid debts. An anonymous person paid all of Ryans' debts off, and he was released. Codringer assumes that Ryans went to work for the person who freed him. He also thinks that this person is likely a wizard in the Four Kingdoms, but has not figured out which one yet. Codringer then informs Geralt that King Foltest's guard had also hired him to look for Ciri. Codringer told the guards to come back in two weeks, and, when they did, Codringer had hired some people to act as fake witnesses. These fake witnesses said they saw Ciri die of disease in a refugee camp. The witnesses did such a great job of acting that the guards were crying for Ciri when they left Codringer's place. When King Foltest heard back from the guards, he apparently believed them and called off the search for Ciri. Geralt is pleased at this, but points out that it is only a temporary solution. People will learn that the girl lives eventually. Codringer asked Geralt to come to a secret room in the back of the office to talk about this. The hidden door leads to a massive library, where he meets Codringer's elusive associate, Finn. Finn is a legless dwarf who uses a wheelchair to get around. He has an idea on how to make everyone give up on searching for Ciri for good. Basically, Finn has found that Ciri's father, Dunny, may have lied about being of noble birth. If Dunny is a commoner, then that would taint Ciri's bloodline and make her right to the throne called into question. But Ciri does still have Queen Calanthe's blood from her mother, and that may still be enough to make the kings continue to hunt her. Finn is not 100% sure this plan will work. Codringer and Geralt go back to the front office and discuss a few things. First, Codringer knows of a girl in Bruja who apparently looks just like Ciri. He suggests killing this girl and making sure the guards find the corpse so that they will call off the search for Ciri for good. Geralt refuses this idea immediately. Second, Codringer also tells Geralt that a group of three assassins, led by a man known as the Professor, are following Ciri and Yennefer. Geralt will of course go after them. Lastly, Geralt has asked Codringer to look into the prophecy of the Child of the Elder Blood. Codringer said the price would be 500 crowns, which Geralt cannot afford. Geralt makes a bet, where Codringer throws a special throwing star called an Orion at Geralt. I'm putting these few paragraphs onto the screen because they are pretty funny, especially the line referring to Yennefer, which basically says she will pay the 500 crowns just to hear that Geralt lost. But the gist of it is that Codringer will look into the prophecy of the Elder Blood. I skipped over the part of the book where we are introduced to a man named Applegat. Basically, he is a royal messenger from Edern, 
and rides between kingdoms to deliver messages. His job was rather obsolete for several years because kings were just using magic to deliver the messages. It was faster, and they didn't have to worry about the message being lost if a messenger was killed or captured. But now the kings have secrets that want to keep from the wizards, so Applegat is busy again. In the next part of the story, we are seeing things from Applegat's perspective. Applegat has messages to deliver to Redania, and has taken a stop at an inn to rest and eat. While eating, Geralt approaches him and tells Applegat that he should leave. Applegat is confused, but says his horse must rest, therefore he will not leave. Geralt acknowledges this and tells Applegat not to come outside, no matter what. Geralt then leaves. Judging by his appearance and manners through all of this, Geralt could have recently taken some elixirs. Not long after Geralt leaves, a group of three men come into the inn. Through the banter between them, you learn that this is the professor and his two assassins which Codringer had told Geralt about. One of the assassins is looking out the window while the others are talking inside. The one looking out the window tells the others that Geralt is out there. Geralt says, quote, You have a choice. Either one of you comes out here and tells me who hired you, and you leave here without any fuss, or the three of you come out. I'm waiting, end quote. All three come out, but none of them are excited about it. From Applegat's perspective in a corner of the inn, the fight is viewed as a lot of screaming, yelling, and a couple of thuds. After a little bit, one of the assassins comes running back into the inn. As he crosses through the door, a sword flies through the air and stabs him through the back. Geralt walks into the inn and retrieves his sword. He tells the innkeeper that there is probably reward out for these three men, and that Geralt is not interested in it. Three days after the events at the inn, Applegat has finally arrived at Tritagor in Redania, but in the middle of the night. King Visimir would not be available for a visit at this time of night. But Digixtra, the head of Redania's intelligence network, is waiting for Applegat and receives the messages. Some messages cannot be turned over to the wrong hands in case a messenger is attacked and robbed. So while the couriers do deliver written messages, they also have to memorize and recite very important messages. Applegat does have one of these memorized messages which he recites to Digixtra. I'll put it on the screen, but it basically says that the fake attack discussed in Blood of Elves is ready to go. This is the attack which was intended to make it look like the Inelf Guardians attacked the Four Kingdoms. That would allow the Four Kingdoms to then have a just cause for war, and they could go down and capture Sintra from the Nilf Guardians. The other part of this message confirms that the kings do believe Ciri is dead. Digixtra gives the written messages to return to Edirn, as well as a message for Applegat to memorize. I'm putting this one on the screen as well, but it basically says that Nilfgaard knows about the fake attack, and have put an army in the area. When the Four Kingdoms try to make it look like the Nilf Guardians attacked, a real Nilf Guardian army will be there, ready to march. Applegat is warned of heavy Scoia'tael activity in the area before being put right back on the road again, because a message like this cannot wait. The scene then switches to a group of three Scoia'tael elves who see a lone human riding on a horse. A lot of their conversation is in the Elder Tongue, so we can't see exactly what's being said. But the elf named Yavin decides he will try to shoot this human, even the, though the other two try to say it will cause too much trouble. Yavin loses an arrow which hits the man. The man it hit was Applegat, who dies instantly. The warning about the Nilfgaardian army will never reach Redania. Next we are following Ciri and Yennefer, who are still on the road. They arrive at a crossroads where Scoia'tael corpses are hung up to intimidate the other squirrels or those considering joining their ranks. The scene is so disgusting that the two ride by at a gallop. They soon arrive at the city of Gorsvelin. Yennefer wants to avoid drawing any attention to Ciri in the city. Yennefer applies a special ointment called Glamorai to her face before they enter the gates. All the guards are so captured by Yennefer's beauty that they do not even look at Ciri. Yennefer says she will be going to a conference at Thanid, and the guards let them through. Ciri and Yen talk while on their way to a bank. Yennefer plans to send Ciri to a school in the area, and Ciri is far from happy about it. She hoped that they would be meeting Geralt, but that is not the case. Ciri's complaints are mocked and quickly silenced by Yennefer before they arrive at the bank. They enter the bank, 
and a dwarf named Giancardi greets them and guides them to his office. Siri is given a book to keep her busy as Giancardi says that he has no new mail for Yennefer. Giancardi relates to Yennefer several strange things going on in the market, which imply that the Four Kingdoms are getting ready for war, such as a large number of ships being built and a sudden interest in jewels. Yennefer makes several financial transfers. She makes a large donation to Militel's temple, and makes a payment to the wizard school Artuza for one student. Finally, Yennefer withdraws some spending money so she can buy some dresses for the conference. Giancardi also says that Geralt has taken a job in the nearby plantation named Hirundum. He asks if Yennefer may accidentally make a stop by there, but Yennefer says no and asks to change the subject. Siri was able to hear everything that was said between the two of them. Yennefer and Giancardi have more business to discuss privately, so Giancardi has a clerk take Siri around the town in the meantime. The clerk is a human named Fabio Sachs Jr., and he's about Siri's age, but much shorter. Yennefer reluctantly agrees and gives Siri some spending money with instructions to return to the bank by noon. She also gives Siri an amulet to keep in her pocket. If Siri gets in trouble, then she should use a spell on the amulet. It will get her out of trouble in an emergency, but it may also draw the attention of wizards in the area if activated. Siri and Fabio walk around the town and look at shops and try new foods. At one point, they go on the city walls, and Fabio points out their surroundings. Off in the water is a tall, cylindrical mountain with several towers built into the sides. This is Thaned Isle. Fabio points out some of the towers constructed by the elves. He points out Garstang Palace, where the wizards will soon have their conference. He also points out another tower at the top named Torlara, or Seagull's Tower. The island also has a large overhang with beautiful scenery, which Fabio identifies as the wizard school Artuza. Near the bottom of the island is Loxia's Palace, which has a bridge connecting to the mainland. Siri asks how frequently Fabio sees the students from Artuza, and he says never. They are not allowed out of the school, and only those associated with the school are allowed in. This only reinforces Siri's distaste of the school. Siri next asks Fabio to point out the way to Herundum. Fabio is confused about why Siri is interested in Herundum, but eventually points out the road and says that the plantation is about 15 miles away. They continue exploring the city and market. At one point, Fabio sees a fortune teller, Booth, and expresses interest in going. Siri makes fun of him and asks what it is that makes him want to prophecy so much. He says he wants to know if he will one day become an explorer. Siri's head is suddenly sent spinning. She sees Fabio's future and knows that he will in fact become a great explorer and discover a new continent. A cape on that continent will be named after him. He will die far from home at the age of 54 due to a disease which does not yet have a name, leaving a wife and four children behind. Fabio comments on Siri's strange appearance. She doesn't know what happened and suggests finding more food. Within seconds, Siri forgets everything she just saw. Later, in the market, they find somebody selling seats to see a caged basilisk. Siri and Fabio get seats, but she quickly discovers that it is not a basilisk, but a mere wyvern. Siri calls the showman out on it, and is eventually asked to step up to the cage if she is not afraid of it. Siri does step up and proves her point. But at the same time, this enrages the wyvern so much that it is able to break out of the cage. While the crowd runs in panic, Siri draws Fabio's sword from the sheath, kills the wyvern, and hands the sword back to Fabio. Siri does not want the attention from slaying a wyvern. While some of the crowd is angry at the showman for bringing the wyvern into the city, others are looking for the girl who taunted it. Siri decides this would be a good time to use the amulet which Yennefer gave her and make an escape. The amulet turns Siri invisible, and she escapes the crowd with a plan to meet with Fabio later. Siri and Fabio do meet each other outside and try to get their story straight for when they get back to the bank. But Siri's use of the amulet also drew the attention of two nearby wizards. Tissaia de Vry and Margarita Lo and Teal begin questioning Siri, thinking she is a student who escaped the school. While Siri keeps quiet, Fabio gives enough information to make the wizards take Siri back to the bank. The scene changes to Tissaia, Margarita, better known as just Rita, Yennefer, 
and Siri and Asana late in the evening. Everything was straightened out at the bank, and Yennefer and Siri were invited to come stay with Tissaia at the luxurious inn named the Silver Heron. Tissaia used to be the principal of Artuza, and she was the principal while Yennefer and Rita were students there. Now Rita is the principal, and she is excited about having Siri as a student, though it does not seem she knows who Siri is. Honestly, this little detail has confused me a lot so far, and continues to confuse me. It seems that everyone knows the legend of Ciri, the gray-haired and green-eyed girl who is the heir to Sintra's throne and sought after by nearly every kingdom. But even people like Tissaia and Rita, very influential and powerful people, seem to be completely unaware of it. Anyways, back to the story. The innkeeper eventually yells from behind a curtain that a guard is hoping to deliver a message to them. Rita and Yennefer throw off their towels, while Tissaia scolds them for their childishness. When the guard enters, they are surprised to see that the guard is a female, and the nudity caused no embarrassment. The guard captain, named Rayla, reports that Tissaia's orders have been completed and asks to leave. Before she is let go, Yennefer asks some questions about Rayla's background. When Rayla is allowed to leave, Yennefer points out that this is the one in charge of the Scoyatel who are left hanging at the crossroads. Siri is eventually asked to go fetch more wine for the ladies, and, while doing so, she sees Rayla leave. The city gates were closed, but Rayla rudely insists that she is working for Tissaia, and they better open the gates for her. When Siri returns, the sorceresses are still talking. The conversation drifts to their love interests, and both Yennefer and Tissaia feel that Rita should not be saying the types of things she is saying in front of a future pupil. They ask Siri to go get more wine. This time, she does not come back. When the sorceresses go upstairs to see what happened, they are informed that Siri implied she has important work to do for Yennefer, and the gates were opened. She also left a message, which I'll put on the screen. She uses many of the lines that Rita had used in their conversation with Yennefer and Tissaia, but it basically says that Siri has gone to see Geralt before she is sent to school. The scene changes, and we follow Siri on her late night ride. It is extremely cloudy, and lightning is constantly flashing, but no rain. While Ciri is trying to follow the road to Hirundum, she begins seeing mirages. First, she sees a group of Scoyatel and rides wildly away. After that, she sees a mirage of the Black Knight from Sintra, and she begins to run again. When she finally has her head on straight, Ciri realizes that she is lost in a swamp. A large number of skeletal men Riding skeletal horses begin to appear in the sky, singing a ghostly song. At the front of the riders is the king of the wild hunt, with fire burning in his eye sockets. I'm putting this scene on the screen as well. I think the king of the hunt's words are interesting to compare to what Yennefer says in Blood of Elves, regarding how magic is a key to the door which contains chaos. At first, Ciri thinks the wild hunt may be another hallucination, but that idea is quickly dispelled, and she begins to ride as she feels the horsemen close in on her. The scene switches to Dandelion, a halfling named Bernie Hoffmeyer, and his wife Petunia Hoffmeyer at Hirundum. Bernie and Petunia are providing Geralt lodging, while he looks into a possible monster that killed a child in a nearby pond. The three are discussing this and the upcoming conference at Thaned when Geralt returns. He comments that the Wild Hunt is roaming tonight. Because it is in the summer, they should only ride in the sky and sing songs, which tend to cause nightmares. Geralt simply suggests closing the window shutters. As he is saying this, he hears the sound of horses, but only one of these horses are real, while the rest are ghosts. Geralt and the human horseman, who you can safely assume is Ciri, see each other. Geralt raises his sword and charges. Before he can engage, Yennefer comes down from the sky in a bright orb. She casts a spell and shoots arcs of lightning after the spectral riders. The wild hunt wraps up into a ball and vanishes back into the sky. Ciri dismounts her horse, and Yennefer comes down from the sky. Ciri, unable to decide if she should run to Geralt or Yennefer, instead faints. Geralt and Yennefer at some point have a very deep and personal talk, and their relationship is now almost at a state of normalcy. Yennefer has invited Geralt to join her at the banquet at Artuza the night before the big conference, and Geralt accepted. Geralt, Ciri, Yennefer, and Dandelion 
were able to acquire lodging at Loxia Palace at the base of the island. Yennefer and Geralt are now attending the banquet at Artuza. Geralt complains about the lack of areas to sit and the lack of food, while Yennefer tries to instruct him on proper manners. As Geralt is preparing a plate for Yennefer, he tells Yennefer that he loves her for the first time. Yennefer responds by eventually telling Geralt that she loves him for the first time. It makes Geralt choke on his food. At the start of the video, I said that this book has a lot of side characters that I will only lightly touch on, like the Hofmeyer halflings we met not long ago. I do not feel comfortable going into that little detail regarding some of the wizards we are about to meet. Many of them we will see later in this book, and I feel we will see more in later books. So just a warning, you're going to be meeting quite a few people here, and I'll try to keep you up with who's who. The first person to approach Yennefer and Geralt is a very, very scantily clad ex-schoolmate of Yennefer's named Sabrina Glevesig. Sabrina and Yennefer take turns passive-aggressively trying to shoot insults at each other, while Sabrina secretly tries to flirt with Geralt. At one point, Geralt gets such a good view of Sabrina that he gulps and stares at Yennefer instead. Immediately after, Yennefer spots Philippa Eilhart and Digixtra. She pulls Geralt over to meet them. They trade a few jokes before Yennefer pulls Geralt away to say hello to Triss. While they are exchanging greetings and quietly discussing Ciri, the hall suddenly enters a commotion. The chapter of wizards and the highest council have arrived. Yennefer introduces them as they enter. First is the chapter. The first member of the chapter to enter is Gerhardt of Ale, also known as Hen Gedimdith. He is the oldest living wizard. Next to him is Tesea de Vries, who we have already met. She is actually about the same age as Gerhardt, but she hides it using elixirs. Next is Francesca Findebear, also known as Indy Engliana. She is an elf with long golden hair and often considered the most beautiful woman in the world. Next is Viljaforts, who is very shady in Blood of Elves. He's a very young wizard who holds a lot of influence. The last member of the chapter is Artod Terranova, who is a very oafish and rather dumb wizard we met in Blood of Elves as well. Lydia Van Bredevort also accompanies them. She is Viljaforts' mute assistant whose maimed face is covered by an illusion. Yennefer describes her as a person of no importance. After the chapter of wizards enter the hall, the three, three members of the council of wizards enter. These wizards are all advisors to different kings. They are introduced as Faircart of Sidaris, Radcliffe of Oxenfurt, and Carduin of Lan Exeter. Philippa Eilhart is also a member of the council. Geralt also now learns, for the first time, that Yennefer is on the council. Yennefer sends Geralt to get some wine. As Geralt is returning, he sees Yennefer chewing Triss out. By the time he is back at the table, Triss is gone. Geralt is correct in assuming that Yennefer was getting on Triss for sleeping with Geralt in the past, and she now turned some of this rage on Geralt too. But Yennefer also let Triss know that they remained friends. Yennefer says she must go talk to some of the chapter members, but kisses Geralt before she leaves with promises of more action to come. As soon as Yennefer leaves, Geralt loosens some buttons on his shirt and begins double fisting goblets of wine. Digistra joins him shortly and begins trying to politely get information from Geralt, but Geralt is very rude back at him. Digistra tells Geralt that the chapter wizard Viljaforts will try to pull Geralt aside later and question him. Geralt does not believe this. Geralt believes he is out of all the political machinations that interest kings and wizards, so they will leave him alone. Geralt leaves Digixtra and goes to try a different table with the shrimp. On his way to the new table, he overhears Sabrina Glebezig talking with a red-haired friend named Marty Sodergren, an elder tongue. The two are discussing Geralt's relationship with Yennefer, as well as the things they would like to do with Geralt. The wizard Dora Gray is the next person to approach Geralt. We met Dora Gray at the start of Sword of Destiny. He is a wizard opposed to the killing of monsters, and joined Geralt on a dragon hunt. Dorgare begins pointing out all the clothing articles people are wearing made from monsters and animals on the brink of extinction. While they are discussing this, Philippa Eilhart comes in and manages to drag Geralt off to another table. She warns that Dorgare is spying for Ethane of Sedaris. Geralt, getting used to the trend of 
people pulling him aside and then trying to pry information from him, tells Philippa he does not care for politics, so don't bother questioning him. They discuss the events near the end of Blood of Elves, where she let Ryan's escape so that Geralt could not learn who hired him. Philippa responds by making a promise to Geralt. She will deliver Ryan's to him tomorrow. She will give no further details on the subject, small talks with Geralt a bit, and then she is called away to talk to some other wizards. The next wizard who introduces herself to Geralt is a small, blonde, and scantily clad sorceress named Kira Metz. While Kira is flirting with Geralt, Marty Sodergren approaches him and also begins flirting with him. This is where Yennefer finally catches back up with Geralt. Apparently, in the huge hall where the banquet is being held, there are eleven women wearing mostly transparent clothing. Yennefer finds Geralt talking with two of them. Yennefer jokes with him about this and then states that she has come to get Geralt and introduce him to Viljaforts. She warns Geralt that conversations with Viljaforts may seem lighthearted and arbitrary, but that is never the case. Geralt is brought over to talk to the entire chapter. All five of them seem to be hiding something other than Tesea. She is the only one who seems genuine to Geralt. Viljaforts eventually asks Ger Geralt to join him for a private talk. His assistant Lydia joins him. If I were having a book club, club discussion on this next part of the book, then I could ramble and theorize for a very long time. Basically, Viljaforts, Geralt, and Lydia go strolling through an art gallery. The paintings present the history of the wizards, and Viljaforts launches loaded questions at Geralt between exhibits. At the end, Lydia ends up hanging a portrait of her own, which Geralt admires as beautiful. Geralt and Viljaforts continue on without Lydia. Viljaforts explains the history of wizards having important conferences in the Tower of Garstang. He also explains that Garstang is protected by a magic ward, which prevents people from casting spells. Above Garstang is Torlara, the Tower of Seagulls. According to Viljaforts, there is a portal in this tower, which leads to Torziriel, the Tower of Swallow. This second tower is said to be the home of ancient elven sages and wizards, but the portal was so decayed by the time that it was discovered that those who interacted with it were often killed. As a result, the wizards decided to block the portal off. Viljaforts is explaining all this as they cross an old bridge between two wings of Artuza. Viljaforts repeatedly insists that Geralt stay on the dark tiles. I'm going to put this next part on the screen because I am not sure what it is that is being said. I thought at first that it was talking about Geralt reaching out to protect Lydia, but Lydia has already left the scene. Maybe it's somehow referring to Ciri or Yennefer, or maybe something was lost in translation. Let me know what you think in the comments. Viljaforts and Geralt reach an office, and Viljaforts finally starts getting to the point. He would like to make an alliance with Geralt. Viljaforts believes this alliance would have historical impacts worthy of another painting in the Hall of Glory they just walked through. Viljaforts says that Geralt could even become a sorcerer. Geralt laughs at this offer, saying that the two of them are too different. Viljaforts gives a summary of his past. He was born and abandoned. When his magical ability surfaced, then it was clear that one or both of his parents were wizards. He grew to hate all wizards due to the ones who abandoned him at birth. Viljaforts worked as a brutal mercenary who did unspeakable acts. His adventures eventually brought him across a sorceress. He entered a romantic relationship with her, but she treated him like dirt. Eventually, he struck out and went to become a sorcerer himself, in large part out of hatred for the sorceress who held herself above him. Geralt still does not think there are any similarities between himself and Viljaforts, so he demands that he just explain what deal he is offering. Viljaforts warns that chaos is about to run wild, and Viljaforts is on the side with the greatest chance of surviving. Geralt, once again, tries to remain neutral. Viljaforts begins appealing to his neutrality by saying that taking this agreement will keep Ciri safe. Geralt sees this as a threat and begins to respond in an unfriendly manner. Viljaforts tells him to sleep on it. Yennefer and Geralt find a dormitory at Artuza and make love three times that night. They discuss the meeting with Viljaforts, Geralt's little dream of finding a house to live in with Ciri and Yennefer, and Ciri's time at the school. Geralt still has a lot of questions, but Yennefer says they will be answered tomorrow. During all this, 
Dandelion and Ciri were kept at Loxia Palace at the base of the island. Ciri's room is protected by a spell from Yennefer, which stops people from entering, but also stops Ciri from leaving. She falls asleep in her room, and winds up viewing a conversation between Finn and Codringer from the perspective of Codringer's cat. Codringer has uncovered a document, which traces Ciri's bloodline back to Falka. Falka led a very violent revolution about six generations ago. When the revolution failed, she was burned at the stake. Before she died, she said she held elder blood in her veins, and one of her descendants would one day come to avenge her. Ciri is now the only descendant of Falka left, and it is believed that her son will be the one who causes the destruction of the world. We are not sure who else does and does not know about the full extent of this prophecy. Codringer does not want to share this information with Geralt. He thinks Yennefer may be using Geralt for her own ends, so neither of them can be trusted. He hires people to go hunt Ciri down, and he thinks it is them who are now knocking on the door. Codringer opens the door and finds three thugs hired by Ryans. They kill Codringer and then move to the hidden library. Finn tries to put up a fight, but he is shoved out of his wheelchair. The thugs take the documents pertaining to Ciri and Falca, and then light the library on fire with Finn still inside. When Ciri wakes from this dream, Yennefer is there, and the protection spell has been taken down. Ciri willingly goes with Yennefer. Sapkowski takes some time here to talk about how the following events will shape the future of the world. When an author does something like this, it is usually a warning that a lot of important and confusing action is going to be coming at you fast. We'll be seeing a lot of the wizards from the banquet. If you see a name which is unfamiliar, pause the video and check the video description. I have provided my description of all the wizards down there. Geralt and Yennefer spend the night at a room in Artuza, like I said before. They have lodgings at the base of the island at Loxia Palace, but they didn't want to wait until they got down there to hop into a bed. If Geralt went to bed at the bottom of the mountain instead of at Artuza, then he probably would not have been allowed back into Artuza this morning. But, as it is, Artuza is where he spent the night. Geralt wakes before Yennefer and decides to walk around a bit. His Witcher medallion alerts him that spells are being cast nearby, and he hears screaming. Geralt goes to investigate. When he reaches the hall that the noise is coming from, Digixtrel holds him up and tells Geralt to go no further. He sees Artod Terranova being arrested by Kira Metz. They put handcuffs of iron and demiridum on his wrists, which stifle a wizard's ability to use magic. Kira and another wizard named Deathmold ask Dig Digextra to take Geralt to see Philippa. Deathmold has only been mentioned so far. We've not officially met him and we aren't going to meet him, but I'll keep his name up on the screen. As they are heading to Philippa, Digextra tries to question Geralt, but Geralt only responds with jokes. Digextra only loosely hints that many wizards have sided with the Nilfgaardians, and a coup is underway to arrest them all. If a wizard like Yennefer went to bed last night, then it is very likely that they are being woken up at this moment and being arrested. When they get to the next room, Triss, Radcliffe, and Sabrina Glevisig are all there and are on the side staging the coup. Although they intended to avoid any deaths, Lydia Van Bredevoort is dead on the ground. The illusion which covered her face is now gone, and it is a gruesome sight. The interesting thing which nobody is able to explain is how Lydia died from her own dagger. When Triss takes her eyes away from Lydia, she sees Digextra and Geralt. She immediately runs up to Geralt and blinds him, hinting that the less he sees, then the more likely he will live. Philippa's voice is heard as she enters the room, and says that Head Gedindeth is apparently suffering a heart attack. She asks that Marty Soldergren get woken up to come tend to him. She also asks that Triss wake Dorgray, Carduin, and Drithelm, and then bring them to Garstang, because they are all advisors to kings and will need to see what happens. To say it of Rise can then be heard entering the hall. She is the only member of the chapter to not be arrested, because Francesca Findebear is also soon escorted across the hall in shackles. Tissaia had no idea what her fellow chapter members were up to, and she objects to seeing Francesca arrested. But Philippa informs Tissaia that Nilfgaard promised Findebear an independent state ruled by elves as reward for turning against the northern kingdoms, 
and Findabare agreed. All of the prisoners are brought up to Garstang. Philippa tells Digistra to take Geralt back down to Luxia, and she will deliver Ryans to him later. During all of this, Geralt asks about Yennefer four times, but never gets a straight answer. Geralt's sight is restored to him, and he starts going down to Loxia with Digixtra. After some time going down the stairs to Loxia, Digixtra says he cannot let Geralt go back up and find Yennefer. Digixtra needs Geralt to get Ciri out of Loxia, so that he can bring her back to Redania. While Digixtra is waiting for a response, Geralt leans over to drink from a nearby fountain. Although Geralt does not have a sword, he comes back up swinging. Digixtra and his three guards are pretty quickly taken down. Geralt left his swords at Loxia because he could not bring them to the party, but now Dandelion comes running up the stairs with them because of all the commotion at Artuza. Digixtra says that both Dandelion and Geralt will hang for assaulting him and his guards. Geralt returns to the room where he and Yennefer spent the night, but she is not there. He later finds Marty Soldergren, who is crying. She was not able to save Hen Gedimdith, and he died of a heart attack. Her friend Sabrina also punched her in the face, though she does not know why. Geralt asks Marty to show him the way to Garstang. On the way, they see that the wards and illusions covering Garstang are faltering. Dorgray comes running down from Garstang, with Scoyatel behind him. Dorgray is wounded by the squirrel's arrows before Geralt is able to kill one, and the wizard Carduin joins them and kills the other. Carduin gives a vague explanation of what happened in Garstang, but we are about to get a better description, so I'll not bother explaining it. After saying this, Carduin continues running away. Marty stays behind to treat Dora Garay's injuries, and Geralt continues to Garstang, where he expects to find Yennefer. A little later, Geralt is walking towards Garstang when Kira Metz falls out of a window and onto Geralt. She was kicked out the window by Artod, and now has an open fracture on her leg. Before she passes out, Geralt asks Kira to tell him what she knows about Yennefer. Kira gives some more detail on the Garstang negotiations. Philippa, Kira, Sabrina, and Triss were with the Kings. Viljeforts, Francesca, and Artod were with the Nilfgaardians. Tissaia, and nearly everyone else present, is neutral and just wants to maintain the peace. The arguments begin going in Philippa's favor until Yennefer enters the room with Ciri at her side. Ciri is in a trance and says that King Vizimir of Redania was assassinated last night. She also tells of the fake Nilfgaardian attack staged by the Four Kingdoms, which occurred on the same night. Now the kingdoms are getting ready to go to war with Nilfgaard. This infuriates Tissaia, who just wants peace. She tears down the ward which prevents spells in Garstang. Francesca breaks free in the chaos and opens a cellar where Scoyatel come pouring through, led by Ryance and the Black Knight who has haunted Ciri in her dreams. Faircart, Radcliffe, and other wizards we don't know were killed, while Triss was injured. Tissaia realized that her decision to tear down the wards was impulsive and a mistake. She tried to protect everyone, but it was no use. After Kira says all this, Geralt says he must leave her behind, but he will be back. Kira does not believe it. The scene changes, and we are now following Ciri. She is with Yennefer, and they are surrounded by rubble and fire. Ciri cannot remember what happened, so she asks Yennefer questions. Yennefer's answers don't make any sense to Ciri, but we understand that the Nilfgaardian traitors are hunting them. Yennefer also says that she made a mistake by bringing Ciri to Garstang. These two criteria should relieve any concerns about Yennefer being a traitor. Yennefer tells Ciri to run, while Yennefer deals with whatever threat is approaching. If Ciri can get to the yard, then a horse will be there, and it will take her to Loxia. From there, she should find Rita and enter her protection. Ciri begins running, and Yennefer yells after her, quote, I love you, my daughter. Run. End quote. I understand that the two of them will often treat each other as mother and daughter in the future books, so I just wanted to highlight this because it is the first time it has come up. Ciri runs down the stairs and eventually comes across Ryans. She has not met Ryans before, but has the sense to run, ultimately escaping by jumping out a window and into the yard. In the yard, however, she is grabbed by Artod Terranova. He begins talking to her, comparing her to a bird, and chidingly asking for a prophecy. At one point, he asks if he should be afraid of birds. 
Siri enters a short trance and then says he should. At this point, an owl swoops down and rips Artod's eyes from his head. After this, Geralt comes in and shoves his sword through Artod's neck. The owl then turns into a very dirty and scarred Philippa Eilhart. She says she will not be able to give Ryance to Geralt like promised, but she will give him Ciri instead. Ciri runs on foot towards Loxia, while Geralt stays behind and promises to catch up with her. Geralt also gives Ciri a sword. Ciri runs, and not much later, she looks behind her to see the Black Knight chasing her on a horse. This time, it is not a mirage. She enters a small courtyard, and the knight's horse slips on the stones, throwing the knight from the saddle. Ciri asks him to leave her alone, but the knight says he is following orders. He reaches out for Ciri, and Ciri draws her sword. The knight does not even get an attack in before Ciri has him on his knees. She strikes his helmet with, his, with her sword, and the helmet flies off. It reveals that the knight is just a young man, who is now so terrified of Ciri that he is vomiting blood. Ciri does not finish him, and instead takes his horse and continues to ride. Skoyatel come to check on the knight. We learn that his name is Kahir Mar Diffin Ep Kelek. The first name Kahir is all that is normally used. While Kahir is explaining what happened, Geralt shows up and cuts down the Skoyatel. He sees Kahir and recognizes him from Ciri's description of her dreams. Kahir begs not to be killed. He says he is the one who took Ciri from Sintra and ultimately saved her. When Kahir looks up, Geralt is gone, and Kahir eventually faints. Ciri, for some reason, does not ride to Loxia. Instead, she goes to Tor Lara, the tower with the closed portal at the top. As Geralt is climbing after her, Viljaforts comes in. Viljaforts once again tries to recruit Geralt to his cause. Geralt says that most of Viljaforts' plans are now publicly known, and many of his conspirators are dead. But Viljaforts seems to think his side has won. The Nilfgaard army is now marching north. The last time Nilfgaard attacked, the wizards were the decisive factor which pushed them back. Now, the wizards are in a disarray, and will not be able to help put up a defense. Viljaforts also says he is not a pawn to Nilfgaard, but that he is actually using Emperor M here instead. In case you haven't figured it out already, it also becomes explicitly stated here that Ryans works for Viljaforts, so he now has access to the information which Codringer and Finn dug up. Geralt put together that Viljaforts had his assistant Lydia kill herself to distract the wizards staging the coup while he called for assistance from Ryans. That is why they were ready to go at Garstang. If Viljaforts used Lydia in this way, then Geralt will never let him use Ciri. Viljaforts must get through Geralt to get to Ciri at the top of the tower, so the fight begins. Viljaforts draws a wand and wields it like a sword. Geralt has chances to make counterattacks and goes for them, but they are always blocked at an incredibly fast speed. Geralt thinks to himself that no man would be able to parry these blows, and a realization hits him. We do not get to see what that realization is before Viljaforts manages to hit him several times. Geralt is quickly disarmed and beaten to the verge of death before Viljaforts climbs the stairs to the top of the tower and Ciri. Geralt loses consciousness. What Geralt's realization is, we are not told in this book. I get the feeling that somewhere in Viljaforts' past, he was a witcher, and that would explain the swordplay and lightning-fast reflexes. When Geralt regains consciousness, Triss and Yennefer are trying to tend to him. Several bones in his legs and arms are broken. Digextra's guards are running up the stairs, and Geralt warns Triss and Yennefer that they will kill him. They seem to be trapped, but Tissaia teleports to them and rains fire on the guards coming up the steps, killing them. She does not appreciate the king's men interfering with the business of wizards. I am putting the final part of this chapter on the screen because it is difficult to understand why Tissaia kills the guards otherwise. Everyone has been afraid of teleporting around Torlara because of the damaged portal at the top. But the top of the tower, where Ciri and Viljaforts were, has now fallen into the sea. This means that teleporting is safe again, and so Tissaia helps Yennefer and Triss get Geralt to safety. Several weeks and possibly months pass, and we are now following Dandelion as he rides towards Brocolone Forest. Normally the Dryads shoot humans on sight, but Dandelion plays his music 
as he approaches and then sits at the edge of the forest. Eventually, a dryad approaches and Dandelion says he is there to see Geralt. Not much later, Geralt comes to meet him. Dandelion says that Triss told him where Geralt was. Geralt asks Dandelion to explain what has happened in the time that he's been recovering and broke alone. The Four Kingdoms staged the fake attack as provocation for war with Nilfgaard. But when it was immediately revealed to be a fake, Nilfgaard used it as a provocation for war instead. Lyria was immediately conquered through force. Rivia surrendered without a fight. Edern and the remains of Lyria's army tried to make a stand at Aldersburg. The story briefly switches to Chamberlain Evan Helwit to show what happened after the Nilfgaardians won that battle. Up to this point, Nilfgaard was capturing land which they planned to hold on to. After Aldersburg, they began to destroy the land they conquered to scare the kingdoms into signing a treaty. That way, Nilfgaard would hold on to the land that they kept in good shape. Next, the story switches to Rayla's point of view, which is used to show that the Scoia'tael and Nilfgaardians are hunting down refugees and turning them into slaves. Rayla was the guard that Yennefer did not like because she was hanging Scoia'tael corpses in the crossroads. Rayla is traveling at the rear of a group of refugees. The next time the Scoia'tael attack, they will come for Rayla and those with her. She gets those with her to try to hold a narrow pass to buy the other refugees time to escape. They manage to push back a couple waves, but Rayla and the refugees that stay behind all die bravely. While Lyria and Edern fought back against Nilfgaard, the kingdoms of Tamaria, Kedwin, and Redania did not come to their aid. Redania's king was assassinated, as Syria explained at Garstang, and this left the leadership in shambles. They could hardly keep their army together to hold off the Scoia'tael attacking their own lands. The story switches to a conversation between High Priest Willimer, Prince Harroward, and a soldier named Bronobor to explain why Tamaria did not join the fight. Tamaria was in a great position to make Nilfgaard have to fight a war on two fronts, but King Ervil of Verdun surrendered his lands to the Nilfgaardian before any action could be taken. This, along with the forts that Nilfgaard captured early in the war, made it impossible for Tamaria to safely come to Edern's aid so Tamaria instead made a treaty with Nilfgaard. The story switches to following Centurion Diggod, half-named Halfpot, to explain why Kedwin did not join the fight against Nilfgaard. Kedwin moved down into Edern lands and reached the river Dyfna. The Kedwin army was ordered not to engage the Nilfgaardian army, only get to the river and establish camp. What this really means is that Kedwin was going to conquer the northern part of Edern instead of coming to their aid. King Demavend of Edern fled to Redania because Edern no longer exists. Next, Dandelion begins explaining what happened with the wizards. Most of them remained neutral, as in not on Nilfgaard's side or on the Four Kingdoms side. Triss, Philippa, and a few other wizards are working with Redania. Some wizards are also still working for Kedwin. King Foltest of Tamaria kicked all the wizards out of Tamaria, because he feels they betrayed him. Viljaforts has disappeared. Francesca Fendebear became the queen of an elven state in the Valley of Flowers. Emperor Emhir has forbidden Francesca from inviting the Scoia'tael into this land, though. He wants them to continue harassing the humans. Tesea de Vries was overcome with grief at the chaos her fellow wizards caused, and that nothing could be done to right the wrongs that came from it. She wrote a suicide note, which she signed as Lark, the name she had before she became a sorceress. She then cut both of her wrists. Geralt next asks about Yennefer. Dandelion says he has only heard rumors, and those rumors seem to point towards her having allied with Viljaforts. The next day, Dandelion and Geralt leave Brokelone. They go to the edge of the forest where they pick up horses, which were used by Scoia'tael but had to be abandoned. Geralt takes a horse and plans on riding off to find Ciri, because Dandelion earlier said that he did not know where she was. Dandelion will not let Geralt go riding off alone, so he decides to join him. As they are setting off, Dandelion tells Geralt about a rumor regarding Ciri, which comes from Nilfgaard. The scene switches, and we are at the castle of Loch Grimm in Nilfgaard. Several nameless nobles are talking about how Emperor Emhir Far Emrys has finally captured the girl he's been hunting. 
the people are gossiping about how she appears somewhat savage and ugly, and that the rumors of Emhir marrying her could not be true. The emperor enters the hall and sits at his throne. Everyone bows to him and falls silent. Then a girl, introduced as Cyrilla Fiona Ellen Rhiannon, Princess of Sintra, is introduced on the other side of the hall. She is described as a skinny girl, about Ciri's age and appearance, and very clumsy. Emhir flatters the princess and promises to return her to the lands which are rightfully hers, whence he can safely ensure that the northern kingdoms will not attack them. He tells her that she will be kept safe in the meantime at the castle Darn Rowan. This relieves some member of the audience, because Darn Rowan is far away, and it implies that Emhir has no intention of marrying the girl. After the show, Emhir asks his seneschal, named Kalik, to prepare a meeting with him, Vadir de Rideau of Adon, Stefan Skellen, nicknamed Callus, and an astrologer named Zarthisius. When all five are assembled, Emhir asks Zarthisius if he can locate somebody. The astrologer says he can probably get a rough estimate if he has the required materials and time. And here says he will have what he needs, and then dismisses the astrologer. It is strongly hinted that the person M here is looking for is actually Siri, even though he supposedly just saw her. M here next tells Vatir that if either Ryans or Kahir are found, then they are to be captured and tortured until M here gets around to actually questioning them. Then he tells Callus to ready a team to be prepared to capture the person if the astrologer can find her. Emhir seems to think that this person will be with Filgeforts, because he says the same team needs to be ready to kill the wizard. The scene closes with the Seneschal begging for mercy from the Emperor for his son Kahir. This is when Emhir confirms that Siri, the Siri we saw is a fake, and that Kahir and Ryans will have no mercy for sending this fake to him. And this is the last major scene change of the book. It seems we are also jumping back in time, to immediately after the events at Torlara. With all the wards and illusions getting torn down, the portal at Torlara was opened again. Siri felt called to the portal and went through. It opened in mid-air in the middle of a desert called the Pan. Siri fell from the sky and lost consciousness. Siri spends the next 20 plus pages wandering through the desert, struggling to find water, eating insects and eggs for food, struggling with the heat of day and chill of night, and seeing mirages. At one point, she is on the brink of death and falls unconscious. She awakens to a gray unicorn prodding her awake. The unicorn guides Siri to water, and Siri decides to name it Little Horse. The two of them watch each other's backs as they slowly make their way to a distant mountain range. Eventually, they see a large hole in the ground. Thinking water may have collected in it, they descend, only to discover that it is a trap by a native sand burrowing creature with large claws. Siri and Little Horse barely manage to kill a creature and escape, but Little Horse was poisoned in the skirmish. A couple days later, Little Horse's poisoned leg is so bad he cannot go on. While Siri does know healing magic, she has not been able to find an intersection to draw magic energy from in her time in the desert. Eventually, she gets the idea to make a fire from some thorny plants in the desert and draw the magical energy from that fire. Drawing energy from fire is something Yennefer forbade Ciri from doing in Blood of Elves, but under these circumstances, Ciri feels there is no other option. Ciri draws the power from the fire, and it has a tremendous effect on her. She heals Little Horse, calls forth a thunderstorm over the desert so that they will have water, and is elated to have so much power. The fire begins talking to Ciri, and encouraging her to use the power to get back at the Nilfgaardians who wronged her. A black-haired lady appears in the fire and presents a scene in a town square where people are being executed. I'll put this scene on the screen because it also uses the phrase time of contempt a lot. From the way this phrase is used throughout the book, it makes me feel that times of contempt is a popular saying like piece of cake, which must be explained before it can be fully understood. Unfortunately, I've never heard the phrase before this book, so I take the phrase literally. It would mean a time where people are constantly looking down on each other. That would imply people would be willing to commit inhumane acts against those they view as their inferiors. In other words, your stereotypical Nazi felt nothing but contempt for a Jew. 
The lady in the fire tells Ciri to eliminate all those who have wronged her, or those who may one day do so, extending to people she hardly knows, and friends like Fabio or Jara. Ciri tries to argue back, but the black-haired lady insists, and even suggests using the power to kill Yennefer or Geralt. While this is going on, more unicorns have come and are now surrounding Ciri. This black-haired lady is some sort of manifestation of Falca, Ciri's ancestor who led a rebellion and then was burnt at the stake. Ciri becomes so frightened of this power, which Falca calls the Force, that Ciri renounces the power altogether. Ciri falls down and everything goes dark. The unicorns know that Ciri is extremely powerful and considering, consider killing her to eliminate the danger. But one unicorn says that the girl is merciful and cured the young uh, Iroquax, uh, the real name of Little Horse. One unicorn continues to insist that the danger of a person with the Force is too much to let go. But the other says that she renounced the Force and it will never come back to her again. In the end, the unicorns decide to let Ciri go and they leave. Ciri lays there for days never feeling hungry or thirsty or tired. She simply lays there, with no will to go on. She did not even care when a group of Nilfgaardians found her, put her on a horse, and took her with them. Quotes from Witcher lore are inserted at the start of the chapters. I put the one at the start of this chapter on the screen because it relates to Falka. Only after several days does Ciri begin to come to her senses and start paying attention to what is going on around her. Ciri was taken by a Lord Sweers of Nilfgaard, and a militia group which goes by the Trappers. They are taking her back to Nilfgaard for the large reward on her head. She thinks about trying to escape, but she is well bound by the Trappers. In addition, Ciri no longer can feel or use magic. Once again, she is overcome by a sense of melancholy. But one day, while on the road, they come across an old rival of Lord Sweers named Lord Varnigan. The Trappers stay back to watch Ciri, while Varnigan and Sweers talk. It does not take long until they begin trading blows. Varnigan is killed, but Sweers is seriously wounded. Instead of helping Sweers, the trappers kill him and decide to take the reward for themselves. Ciri tries to run in the chaos, but the trappers quickly catch her. The trappers arrive in a village which was called White River before the Nilfgaardians captured it. Now it is called Glyswin. They decide to give their horses a break and get some food in town. The gate guard tells them that there is another militia group called the Nasir also in town. They have captured the bandit Kaylee, who is a member of a notorious group called the Rats. The Nilfgaardian law states that bandits like Kaylee should be killed on the spot, so the townspeople are not happy that the Nasir are transporting him for a bounty. The trappers arrive at the inn and meet their friends the Nasir. Kaylee is tied up to a pole, and Ciri is tied up next to him while the trappers and Nasir talk. Apparently, Kaylee was caught while visiting a girl in the town of Newforge. The mayor of Newforge told the Nasir where to find him, and now the Nasir are bringing him back to Baron Lutz for a reward. The Nasir and trappers order food, and they begrudgingly order some from Kaylee and Ciri. Ciri is instructed to fa feed Kaylee since his hands are bound. Kaylee tries to get Ciri to obtain a knife from the innkeeper, because the rest of the rats will be coming soon, and he does not want to be defenseless when the chaos breaks out. Ciri is reluctant to do so, but changes her mind when she begins overhearing the Nasir discussing taking Ciri out back and raping her. The innkeeper reluctantly gives her a knife, and she uses it to cut Kaylee's binds while she feeds him. As soon as she finishes cutting the bindings, the other five rats come charging in through the windows and doors, cutting down the Nasir and trappers. Ciri is unarmed, but she manages to get between Kaylee and the leader of the trappers, ultimately saving Kaylee's life. When only the rats, Ciri, and the leader of the trappers are left, the rats throw Ciri a sword and watch her fight the trapper leader. They are impressed at Ciri's speed and grace, but Ciri will not put in the killing blow, though she has many chances to. The rats become worried about how much time this is taking, and they kill the leader of the trappers. They all run outside and ride out of town. On the way, they are attacked by the villagers. Ciri reacts in self-defense at one point and cuts a villager's throat open. This is the first man that Ciri has ever killed, and it rocks her to her core, but she keeps riding. When they get out of town, the rats deliberate what to do with Ciri. 
Kaylee stands up for her, and eventually they decide to take her with them to their nearby hideout. The rats are made up of a group of misfits who are left and abandoned. The six of them all coincidentally met at a festival, and they formed a group which liked to dress colorfully, collect trinkets, and terrorize the Nilf Guardians with their raids and plundering. The Nilf Guardians referred to them as rats, and they kept the name. They are all pretty much aged around 16 years old. Siri does not give any details about who she is or where she is from. The rats actually respect that, and offer to at least let her sleep in a safe place for the night. Siri goes to get some blankets, and when she comes back, the rats have a solemn initiation ceremony for her. At the end, Siri is asked to choose a nickname. She speaks in the elven tongue and says, Gavalchka, which translates to Falka. Siri sleeps in a corner of the cave, and Kaylee comes to join her. Kaylee begins t touching Siri all over, and Siri is clearly uncomfortable with this. Another rat named Missile comes and kicks Kaylee out from the sheets. Missile soon takes the place Kaylee filled, and she begins touching Siri seductively. It would seem Siri eventually gives in, because the two of them spend the whole night together. When Siri wakes the next morning, she gives Missile a kiss. Siri then goes to bathe in the nearby river, where she tried to, quote, remove what could not be removed, end quote. Honestly, there are just too many things this could be alluding to, and I'm not sure what specifically it is. The scene switches one final time to the offices of the governor of Amarillo. A maimed soldier is relating how the rats attacked their supply convoy, and that this time there were seven of them. A little girl, about 13 or 14 years old, was there, and she danced with a sword better than anyone he had seen in the conquest of Edern. The other rats called her Falca. The soldier is allowed to leave, and Callus talks with the governor. Callus tells the governor to find and kill these bandits without mercy because they will be searching for a young girl in the area. The governor suggests that maybe this young girl is also the new member of the rats, but Callus dismisses the idea quickly. He tells the governor to hang all seven of them. And that is where Times of Contempt ends. We finally have an understanding of what Ciri's destiny is. Geralt and Dandelion are hunting for Ciri, and there is a good chance they will go to Nilfgaard to look for her. We don't know where Yennefer is or what Viljafort is doing. The elves have their own kingdom, though there are some serious stipulations, and Edern has also fallen. Ciri is being hunted by Nilfgaard while she lives with a group of bandits. Please leave any comments, corrections, ideas, or suggestions in the comments below, and I'll see you all soon.